So today we are going to go over how should we size the stent for a distal, um, for a vessel. Now there are different type of vessels that we deal with. And if you look at the clinical trials, they utilize a lot of areas in defining the size of the stent. But when you deal with the stents, you do not get the areas. You do not ask, okay, can, can I get a 6.45 millimeter square stent size? Rather you ask for a diameter. So I'm gonna go over in this video how I do my stent sizing and I'll be more than happy to see your comments at the end. So let me begin by this whiteboard. So first we'll go over the angiographic sizing. So let's say there's this vessel. And as you can see, I'll just denote that with proximal and distal ends so that we are clear with which side we are talking about. There are three scenarios that you deal with when you are sizing angiographically a stent for a vessel. One is it's a non-tapering vessel, which means usually this is the RCA because the vessel is not, it doesn't taper, means there are not many branches coming off the vessel. There are small branches coming off the vessel. So the proximal luminal area or the diameter is almost similar to the distal luminal area. It can happen in large dominant cirque as well. LED most of the time is tapering vessel because it has branches coming off. The second type of vessel would be something like this. As you can see, there's some taper and people use different type of uh, tapering rates. Personally, I say if, if every 10 millimeter, you lose a millimeter. Oh, I'm gonna say every 100 um, millimeter, you lose a millimeter. So that means if you have, um, it's about, a, about I would say, uh, 10 centimeter size, you lose a millimeter over the course. So if you're starting with a vessel. Now this is based on when there is no branching points, okay? So I utilize this number. So about a long, let's say 50 uh, millimeter or 48 millimeter stent, over the course you can lose up to 0.5 to 0.6 millimeters. And the last type is when you have branches present. So the sizing differs because the size of the branch, let, let me make it more obvious, the size of the branch is much larger, okay? Um, sorry, the size of the main, main feeding vessel is much larger than the branch vessels. And it is considered to be about two thirds the size of the both branches. So um, you can utilize different methodologies in this and I'll go over that now. So there are two type of ways of sizing in case if it is a non-tapering vessel. So non-tapering vessel, it's very easy. Whatever is in the proximal end, same as the distal end. So you can use the distal reference here or you can use the proximal reference here, no issues, angiographically. Whatever you think the distal diameter is, you can ask for the same amount, same diameter of the stent. The issues come when there is branching or there's non-tapering vessel, uh, sorry, tapering vessel. What happens in the tapering vessel? In the tapering vessel, the size of the distal reference is important to take into account. Because if you are not taking this into account, you can cause distal dissection, even perforation of the vessel. 
when you are dealing with the branches, okay, again, you need to take into account the size of the branch that you're going to land the stent in because that is important. The proximal can all, always be expanded. So one way to size this is by utilizing the distal reference diameter and using the same stent size or the branch vessel size as the stent size. And then once you have the stent placed, what you can do is you can divide into an imaginary half, half point and then utilize different balloons for distal expansion and proximal expansion. Now, personally, people ask what type of balloon to use, compliant balloon, non-compliant balloon. It depends on the people or the person's um, particular interest, I would say, preference. Most people would use an NC balloon. And the utilization of the NC balloon is that because you can go to higher pressures and not expand too much in terms of the size. While in the compliant balloon, you can expand more than the non-compliant balloon at the same pressure. So let's say you have a 3.5 NC, you go up to let's say 18 atmosphere, Frequently, this is considered high pressure ballooning. And you go to like only 3.6 or 3.7, depending on the vendor of the balloon. While if you're getting a compliant balloon, you can go up to 3.75 at 18 atmospheres. Why is it important? Because personally, I use, I use the compliant balloon where ever the blood vessel is a little bit shaggy like this. It's not, uh, it's uneven. So if I put a compliant balloon here, it will expand like this, but it will not expand too much on this side. So the full strut coverage is, uh, is done. However, if the person has a lot of calcium, the stent is undersized, it's not fully expanding, I will go with a NC balloon in that case, because I don't want that, and if it is an even vessel, I, I don't want it to overexpand the stent. And I also want that calcium outside of the stent to expand as well. All right, so let's go over what kind of different expansion strategies we can utilize. All right. So sorry. All right, so we were talking about various different types of ways to do the sizing of the stent. So we went over the angiographic method where you're utilizing the distal reference as the sizing method for the stent. You can also use the proximal um, reference as well, which means the proximal size of the vessel to size the stent. However, that is not the best way to size the stent unless the, you are trying to only stent the main uh, feeding vessel into two branches. When you come to the imaging size, uh, sizing the stent, uh, frequently, area is utilized to evaluate if the patient has proper sizing of the stent, which becomes very difficult and it's not very intuitive to use when you are sizing a stent. For example, a uh, normal way when you put a stent in a vessel, this is the stent, you obtained what we can we call MSA, minimal stent area, stenosis area, 
or minimal luminal area. Okay, so we utilize that um, the area of either the proximal reference or the distal reference to decide what the expansion is. So for example, let's say your proximal luminal area of the reference is 6.5 millimeters square. The distal is reference area is 4.5 millimeters square. Inside the stent, you measure around, let's say I can say it 5.5 here and 3.5 here distally. Your luminal area will proximally will be the uh, the size that is residual area would be residual stenosis area would be 5.5 divided by 6.5 and you want to achieve less than 10 percent of this similarly in the distal area where there is 3.5, you want to get it 3.5 divided by 5.5. And these are luminal areas, by the way. Pretty confusing. How would you interpret it? Now you do have, um, in the clinical trials, you have to interpret it. But how can you quickly interpret it? How can you quickly utilize it when you are sizing a stent with an IVUS or with an OCT. So this is what I do. And you know, I, I will welcome all the comments and anybody wants to share their, their style. What I do is for a quick IVUS or an OCT run, I look at the distal vessel. This is the distal vessel. This is the EEL, okay. And this is the lumen. So I choose the luminal size or the diameter of the lumen as my, and this is, it should be disease free, okay? Should not be with the disease. I choose that as my stent size. If I'm going with a stent 28 millimeter or longer, I consider it long stent. Now their availability of 28, 32, 38, and even 48 with synergy. I use this diameter to pick up the stent size and then I stent it. If the stent is longer than 28 millimeter, I also utilize the proximal lumen diameter to stent size it. Okay, because it's a longer stent. And even sometimes I use even a cutoff of 20, but you know, literature suggests using the 28. And this is the proximal, okay? So I can average these both, distal and proximal, if I have to put a longer than 28 millimeter stent. So I let me give you an example. So distal it's 2.5, proximal it's 3.5, okay? What would I pick? I would put pick a 3.0. .0. What if the distal is 3.0, proximal is 4.5? I'll put, pick a 4.0 if it is a long stent. Okay, so a little bit more than the distal, and less than rather more towards the distal than the proximal. You also have to make sure that the stent that you're picking up, that stent always have an expansion variable length. And I can provide, if somebody needs a, a chart for that, that is available online. It's available on my Twitter account, which is IQ underscore cat. Um, you can look at that. However, what, what you wanna know is, so many stents. So for example, I can give you example of Synergy. 
the 2.25, 2.5, and 2.75 stands for synergy. All are the same stent, but they are mounted on different balloon sizes. So these are the different balloon sizes. So these stents would go up to a certain length. So they are rated for going up to 3.25. However, you can kind of push them to the 3.75. Again, this is all off-label, nothing on-label, but you will see the values, the maximum expansion values on the package inserts or on the packages. Now, where would be this important? Because Resolute Onyx, their 2.0, 2.25, and 2.5 are the same stents. Their 2.75 is the same stent platform as 3.0 and 3.5. So when I want to put a stent, which is like 2.75, I would pick up Onyx or Resolute because it can go way higher. Okay. If I want, if I have a stent which is smaller in diameter or the vessel that is smaller in diameter, I would pick up maybe Synergy or depending on whatever I want to pick on that day. Um, but, but remember, there are different platforms and the balloon size is the different, uh, is the only difference inside of them. So they can expand. Most of the stent companies, they have like only three or four um, different stent platforms. So look that up and, uh, you know, uh, you can remember or memorize the ones that you're utilizing at your own institution. Anyway, let's come back to what I do. So I use the distal diameter to pick up a shorter stent. I use average of distal and proximal diameters to pick up a longer stent, especially if it is longer than 28 millimeters. Once I pick that up, and it's based on the lumen diameter, remember, not the EEL, not the um, uh, average or mid-wall diameter. These are all different diameters you can utilize. Once I put that in, the stent is put in, then you can image it again, and or you can utilize the values that you have obtained earlier. Now, what you're going to do is, this is the stent. I'm just going to make every stent blue, uh, sorry, every stent green for easy visual visualization. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize the EEL of the distal reference as my guide to choose the post dilatation balloon. You can also use a mid wall sizing, which means you can go in the middle of the vessel. And if this is the vessel, this is the EEL, this is your lumen, mid wall would be somewhere here to here. This is a conservative way to do that. EEL is a little bit more, more uh, I would say aggressive, but you want to use the distal EEL and either you can divide the stent into two different portions, use a different balloon for this and a different balloon for the proximal region. You can utilize the EEL here to size this and the EEL here to size this. So you wanna use the distal EEL diameter. And what is EEL? This is external elastic lamina. Then you can see on the IVUS or um, the OCT, it is very much visible on them. And I can show you what I'm talking about uh, in a second, how the EEL looks like on the vessel lumen. And um, you can just Google it basically. Um, so I utilize that as the diameter of my NC balloon or the compliant balloon. And I told you what, when I use compliant balloon for post dilation and when I use the NC balloon for the post dilation. Okay, once you have obtained that, what you can do is you want to achieve less than 10% of the stent stenotic area of the distal as well as the proximal diameter of proximal area. And uh, OCT is very nice to give that information to you. So what you can do is, um, and I told you the, the formula, it's very easy. 
is basically one minus whatever the stents area you get divided by reference area, okay? Could be a proximal reference or a distal reference. And this should be less than 10%, okay? So it will give you in something in points. You have to multiply by 100 to get the percentage, okay? So you, you wanna achieve it less than 10%. The other way, the simpler way is you want to achieve about 90% of the distal reference luminal area or the proximal reference luminal area. Simple as that, okay? Or if you're ju just utilizing the diameter, you wanna achieve, let's say, the distal luminal area was 3.5, you wanna achieve around 3.4 to 3.3. Just uh, about 0.2 because the balloon sizes are available in the decrement of 0.25, you wanna achieve it between within 0.25 of the distal or the proximal lumen. Okay, so let's recap that. We went over the angiographic method of sizing. You use the distal reference for a short stent. You wanna use the distal plus the proximal reference divided by two to get an average size for a long stent, more than 28 millimeter length of stent. Once you have put the stent, then you wanna go up by an average of 0.25 of the proximal of the distal lumen and 0.25 of the proximal lumen to dilate the stent. This is, you would use two balloons to size for, uh, to post dilate for the longer stents. Ideally, the post dilatation balloon should not be longer than um, 20 millimeter, in my opinion. I utilize, frequently utilize 15 millimeter so that um, I can properly size uh, post dilate, but nothing longer than 20 millimeter, okay? Because then there will be a lot more tapering. If if the stent is long, you need to get a lot larger in the more diameter balloon proximally. So that was angiographic, talking about the IVUS or the OCT sizing. You wanna use the distal diameter or the area um, by the, uh, by using the OCT or the IVUS. I use the distal diameter of the lumen. Once you get the distal diameter, get the stent for that, uh, that size or the diameter, and then you post dilate based on either EEL or mid wall. You can utilize both ways. Mid wall is less aggressive. EEL is more aggressive. And always remember, IVUS oversizes a little bit. So when you, whatever you see by IVUS, think that the balloon should be a little smaller than the EEL. Because if you use the IVUS to size the EEL, it's very aggressive. OCT is right on the dot. So OCT will exactly give you the EEL um, uh, diameter. And um, you can utilize exactly the same value. Uh, with the IVUS, there's higher risk of perforation because of this. Um, and you wanna be very careful uh, when you're utilizing that. So let's look at the, what I was talking about. What is EEL? So let's go to google.com and Google EEL by OCT. And I'll show you what EEL looks like. Okay, let's give me one second. Um, okay. So you can see on this one, this is EEL. You see this um, kind of translucent line. Now, this is not very clear in every vessel, especially if it is diseased. You can see if it's even more clearer here. You can see this line very clearly, okay? So it says intima is this one. This is what we call also 
media or the border of the EEL and then adventitia is outside of it. How does it look like on IVIS? Again, on the IVIS, it is also a line like this. You can see this, uh, this high point tense line or this line, okay. Now, um, and these are wonderful, <laughs> wonderful um, pictures. However, you may not be able to see the same way on your IVIS yourself. So you can see this high point tense line, as you can see this line, blackish line, this black line. So this, this is measuring the EL, this is measuring the luminal diameter. So you want to scan through the image to find out where exactly you want to measure that because sometimes it not it may not be visible especially in the presence of a pack all right i will i think i'll next time i will go over um the different things that i utilize for evaluating after the stent is placed um, and I call that, um, so let me see. yeah, so you can see this line is what EEL is. Um, I call it melt method, made up myself. Um, basically, what you look at is um, malapposition, expansion, um, and you can use the um, the tissue protrusion is the T. Sorry, having difficulty with the electronics. Um, yes. So um, uh, just get out of this. Okay. So lesion. Uh, I was not writing lesion coverage and tissue protrusion. So this is what you're looking at. There is also other, um, people have come up with different things. Yeah, so let me go over here, melt. Or some people have gone over something called max. Okay, max method or what they mine is malapposition, expansion, lesion coverage, and tissue protrusion. And um, I have to put in um, somewhere um, dissection, I guess. Protrusion and um, I say dissection, melted, I guess, would be the acronym for this. For the max MLD, that's the one that OCT uh, people utilize, that you use MLD for pre-evaluation of the OCT or the imaging and max is for the post evaluation where um, A is for apposition X is for expansion and M is for dissection now I, I have to remember like how did they use the M for, um, for this? But that's, um, I, I remember, it's medial dissection. Hmm. Well, if then get that case, we can use the melt for M2 melt in that way. Malaposition, medial dissection, expansion, lesion uh, coverage, and tissue protrusion. Anyway, I'll talk about this in another video. Don't want to keep on making these videos too long. Um, thank you. And if you if you have any questions or anything you want to learn about, 
please, this is mainly meant for the fellows or the residents who are uh, going into cardiology and who have interest in interventional cardiology. I'll be more than happy to make these videos for you. Thank you very much.